Thank you, Herman. Thank you, all the organizers. And yeah, it's great to be here. I feel home back in Colombia and home. Max Planck Institute is also my home in Germany. So I'm very happy to be here. And uh, I'll present you the, the work we've been doing uh, in Jena, and mostly in this topic of time scales of carbon cycling, and uh, a little bit with uh, a twist towards tropical forests. So, um, this morning we've been, we've been talking about climate change, the global carbon cycle. So this graph shows the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere as measured in the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. It shows how uh, the uh, concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere have gone up since we start continuous measurements in the 1960s. And right now we are above 110 parts per million. Based on um, the physics of the, uh, of the atmosphere and the physics of radiation, we know that that's related to the increase in temperatures. And this graph is showing the average uh, global temperature at the surface of the Earth and how it has gone up. So, and this is obviously related to the greenhouse effect. And we, we know that uh, there is this connection and therefore there is a really big interest in studying the global carbon cycle. Um, yeah, this is probably very hard to see from where you are sitting, but uh, the idea is that um, this is the, uh, a picture, a diagram of the global carbon cycle, the main reservoirs in the ocean, the main reservoirs on land, and also the main reservoirs of fossil fuels and how we are burning that fossil fuels, putting up carbon in the atmosphere and completely modifying uh, the global carbon cycle. <clears throat> we know that from all the emissions of carbon, and we, mostly there are two sources of, of carbon to the atmosphere. One is from fossil fuel burning, and the other is from deforestation. Fossil fuel burning is obviously dominant. We have almost 90% of the carbon that entered the atmosphere in the period between 2008 and 2017. It's actually due to fossil fuel burning. And this is actually has a really uh, uh, big slope of increase or a rate of increase. And uh, tropical deforestation is much lower, but uh, nevertheless important. From all the carbon that goes into the atmosphere, actually not all of it stays there. Only 44% of that carbon stays in the atmosphere. The other uh, uh, part of that carbon will go either to the terrestrial biosphere or to the oceans. And we see that then that about 30% of the carbon that we emit from anthropogenic uh, activities actually ends up either in forests, in grasslands, in terrestrial ecosystems. Therefore, it's extremely important to understand the fate of that carbon that goes into the terrestrial uh, biosphere. And uh, there's been a lot of work trying to understand what happens to the carbon that is emitted to the atmosphere. And this is a graph of uh, different global uh, Earth system models that look at the dynamics of the global carbon cycle and the uh, uh, dynamics of climate. Each line here is uh, the results of one of each particular model. And here we see what happens when we emit one amount of one uh, petagram of carbon to the atmosphere. We emit that carbon to the atmosphere in the model, and we see that that carbon eventually is going to go to the ocean, it's going to go to the land, uh, and it's going to take some time to that carbon to disappear. A lot of that carbon, actually 50% of that carbon will disappear in the first 80 to 100 years, but some of that carbon is going to remain for a really long time, about a thousand years, right? And in global carbon cycle research, uh, people use these um, experiments, these simulation experiments to see what will be the consequences in terms of uh, changes in temperature, global surface temperature, or in ocean sea level, um, see uh, in the sea level rise. So we see here that each model is predicting that uh, there will be a certain amount of warming given that um, emission of carbon and there will be some increase in, this, in, in the sea level due to that emission of CO2. This is extremely important for the atmosphere and to understand the climate. But we also need to look at what happens to the carbon that goes in the opposite direction. So <clears throat> we've been putting a lot of attention of the emissions of greenhouse gases, 
once we, either we have deforestation or we have fossil fuel emissions, that carbon will go to the atmosphere and eventually is going to disappear from the atmosphere. We can compute the amount of warming that will happen um, due to that emission using this formula. But we need to do more research in the other direction. We need to understand what happens to the carbon that is being uh, sequestered by uh, the beta terrestrial ecosystems and for how long it's going to be there. It's extremely important to know for how long that carbon is going to be removed uh, from the warming effects that will happen in the atmosphere. So therefore, we are very interested in, in quantifying, getting some metric of the amount of avoided warming that happens because ecosystems are taking up that carbon. And this is a graph um, actually from Sue Trumbor that shows um, in a in a really nice schematic way what happens to carbon once it enters an ecosystem. First there will be photosynthesis in the leaves and the carbon gets uh, transformed there to sugars and starch and then it will go uh, to different parts of the plant, it will go to the stem, it will go to the roots, uh, some of that carbon is going to eventually go to the soil, but in each of these uh, parts of the ecosystem, the carbon is going to stay there for uh, relatively uh, different time scales. Some of that carbon is going to stay there uh, for a year or maybe less than a year. Some of that carbon is going to be there for uh, years or centuries. And some of that carbon is going to stay there for uh, centuries or even millennia. And if we mm, plot the time since the carbon gets fixed until the carbon gets respired back to the atmosphere once it leaves the ecosystem through the process of respiration or fire, we can actually get this type of curves in which we uh, can observe for how long the carbon actually stayed in the ecosystem. The work if, of my group has been focused a lot on trying to mathematically represent these processes, trying to come out with mathematical models that are more tractable uh, to be able to represent all the complexity that happens in terms of carbon uptake and carbon allocation and carbon release back to the atmosphere. So basically we take all of these different processes and we try to organize them in mathematical equations. A lot of people have done this already and a lot of people have uh, produced models of the, of the carbon cycle, but our contribution has been to come out with relatively simple looking equations that can actually uh, generalize and synthesize all of these models that have been proposed before. So we make use of some uh, concepts from dynamical system theory. Uh, basically, we generalize mathematically these models as something called compartmental dynamical systems. And these systems actually have very interesting mathematical properties. Mathematical properties that we can use to better understand the global carbon cycle. And some of the mathematical properties of these models that we're interested in uh, is something that we call system level diagnostics. And two of them are the, what we call system H and transit time. I don't know if it's easy to see from where you're sitting, but basically we can abstract an ecosystem or any complex system in terms of uh, a system that has multiple reservoirs and you will have matter that enters into this reservoir and it will get mixed there with other matter and molecules and particles that are in this reservoir. And to each of the particles that enters the reservoir, we can attach a clock, a clock that is going to measure for how long this particle is going to stay there. And if we look at the, all of the particles that are in the system and we aggregate them all together and we calculate their means and their statistical properties, then we can come up with something called the system age, which will be the age of all these particles inside the system. If we look at what is leaving the system, what is in the output flux, and we also look at the age of those particles, then we come up with something called the transit time. And this transit time tell us how long did it take for all these particles to go through the whole system. This transit time is extremely important because it tells us a lot about the whole dynamics of the system. It's sort of an integrated uh, measure of everything that is happening in the ecosystem. And this is an example of how do we use this. I'm taking here a global carbon model, a relatively simple global carbon model that has uh, a few different components. One is the non-woody uh, tree part, so basically this will be all the leaves and foliage of, of an ecosystem. 
This will be ground vegetation, small little plants. They take up carbon, uh, but they also respire carbon. But some of this carbon can get uh, allocated either to woody parts or maybe they will produce uh, the detritus. This is organic matter that will stay on the top of, uh, of the soil uh, on the ground. And then some of this carbon may eventually come to the soil, but in all cases you will get respiration. So we have a complex system that represents carbon stocks and fluxes uh, on the Earth system. And we have some preliminary numbers about how much uh, are those, uh, re the size of these reservoirs and how much are the fluxes of these reservoirs. If we take this model, then we can actually look at the fate of that carbon once it's entered. In this model, we assume that about 113 petagrams of carbon enters the terrestrial biosphere each year. And this carbon actually will stay there for some time. Some of that carbon will get respired really quickly. Some of it will disappear in the matter of uh, a few years, but some of that carbon is going to stay there for a long time. Some of this carbon will go then to the, the uh, will enter this foliage in ground vegetation pools. It will move to the wood, and then it will move to the soil, and eventually in the soil will stay there for a relatively long time, and it will have some uh, a relatively long tail. We can also compute then the transit time and the age for this carbon. And this means, and when we do that, uh, we get about these numbers. We get that the transit time of carbon in the terrestrial biosphere could be something of around 15 years. And the age would be something about around 70 years. So this means that the carbon that is taken up by photosynthesis uh, will get absorbed, will get quickly allocated to leaves, but also will get respired really quickly by the, uh, by the organisms. So therefore, it will, it will pass through the system relatively quickly, but we may have a relatively long tail. Some of this carbon will stay there for a really long time. And of course, if it stays there for a long time, when we look at the age of carbon in the system, then we will find that it can stay on average of around 70 years. This is very important because it helps us to understand the time scale at which the global carbon cycle operates. Now, let's look at a map of global photosynthesis. This, is, this was produced in our, in our institute. Uh, this is a diagram of global photosynthesis produced using satellite observations combined with observations from uh, towers that are put on, on, on towers, uh, like, uh, like the ones that was sh were shown before. They measure the exchange of CO2 between the forest and the atmosphere. And when you put these two data sets together, you can actually produce these really nice maps that tell us where, uh, where, how much photosynthesis occurs on Earth. And obviously, we can clearly see that the tropics uh, are the regions where you have the largest uh, photosynthetic fluxes. This is actually where most of the carbon is actually taken up each year. So the tropics play a really important role in taking up carbon from the atmosphere. And as we move to uh, temperate and boreal regions, the, uh, we see much less photosynthesis. Here in the second graph, we see that as we move out of the tropics, we get much less photosynthesis. Okay, but this is how much carbon will come in. The next question is for how long it's going to stay. And this is, these are two maps of the transit time of carbon and the mean age of carbon. And now we see that in the tropics, actually, the carbon stays there for relatively short periods of time between 15 and, and 25 or 30 years. It doesn't stay there for very long, and this has to do with, the, uh, with this huge amount of organisms and biodiversity in the tropics that are taking all this organic matter. They, are <clears throat> they have really uh, fast metabolism, and therefore the carbon goes back to the atmosphere relatively quickly. Uh, in the boreal regions, therefore, uh, we got carbon staying for much longer periods of time. There's much less carbon coming in, but the few carbon that comes in in, in the boreal regions stay there for much longer. So this is very important, actually, to understand uh, what happens in very different regions of the world and how important are they in the global carbon cycle. Something also important for the tropics is that even though carbon stays there for a short period of time, we have the potential to manage tropical ecosystems to make this carbon that is, taking, that is taking up to stay for longer. And this could be an interesting way to think about carbon management in tropical ecosystems. How do we test these ideas? Everything that I showed you before is from models. And to test these ideas, we use um, radiocarbon. 
and particularly bomb radiocarbons. So in the 1950s and 60s, there were a number of uh, atomic uh, or nuclear weapons testing that happens above ground. Uh, and a lot of radiocarbon was produced as the result of these nuclear bomb tests. Uh, there was then an agreement among all developed nations to not do uh, this type of test. And after that, um, the amount of radiocarbon has been decreased in, in the atmosphere. We can use radiocarbon as a tracer of the global carbon cycle. And this tracer can tell us how fast carbon gets incorporated into different organisms. And we use measurements of radiocarbon to get an idea of how fast the global carbon cycle operates. So for example, for the simple uh, carbon model that I show you at the beginning, uh, we can use this model in the, uh, the atmospheric radiocarbon curve to get an idea how much radiocarbon will get incorporated in an ecosystem and what will be the radiocarbon of the res uh, in the respiration of the organisms that take up this carbon in, in, and release it back to the atmosphere. So if we have these two type of measurements and we uh, do these measurements over time, we actually get a really good idea of how fast the, radiocar the, the carbon cycle operates in different parts of the world. So with Susan Trombor, uh, we been working on this really large effort to put together a database of radiocarbon observations, mostly for soils, but, um, but this database actually can tell us a lot about the time scales of carbon cycle coal in, uh, in many different places around the world. Uh, there are a huge no a number of observations that have been already compiled. Uh, since radiocarbon measurements are extremely expensive to do, uh, the value in dollars of this uh, database actually goes um, in terms of millions. I don't remember exactly the number, but it's actually millions of dollars uh, that are for the measurements that are in this database. But now, so I'll talk a little bit more about tropical ecosystems. So we are working at the ATOS uh, side, this infrastructure that Susan Trumbor introduced before. Uh, we are doing measurements of radiocarbon in this uh, forest, basically trying to get an idea of how, what is the radiocarbon signature of the respired CO2 that comes out of the forest, but also the amount of radiocarbon that is incorporated in the leaves, in the stems, in the roots, in the soil of this uh, ecosystem. We have preliminary data for two types of ecosystems that we uh, found in, uh, are close to the Atoll region. One is called Campinarana in the local language. The other is called Terra Firme. There is a similar ecosystem in Colombia called uh, Barijal uh, that is similar to Campinarana. These are a particular type of forests that have very interesting dynamics. And for this type of forest we have, or for the two type of forests, we have measurements of radiocarbon and we get uh, an idea of how much radiocarbon has been incorporated in stems, in litter, in dead wood, in leaves. We see that the leaves in dead wood uh, for the two ecosystems are, have very different values. They're closer to zero. They're actually values closer to the atmosphere. That means this is a relatively fast cycling type of carbon. And for the other type of, uh, of uh, organic matter, we actually have much larger variation and much larger numbers. This tells us a little bit more about that carbon stays for longer in this type of ecosystems. Right now, my student is in Atos. She's collecting gas samples, and we're going to look at the gas measurements later this year. So to summarize uh, this part, um, <clears throat> At the MPI for biogeochemistry, actually, we're interested in studying the time scales of the carbon cycle uh, in many different places around the world because we're interested in global scale phenomena. But we are very interested in studying tropical forests because uh, they have these really large fluxes of carbon. The carbon stays there for a relatively short period of time, but we can actually think about ways in which can make this carbon stays for a little bit longer in tropical ecosystems. Um, and we use radiocarbon. Radiocarbon is one of our main tools because this is the clock to measure process rates in the uh, global carbon cycle, or particularly in the terrestrial biosphere. Now, I think I have time, and I want to talk about a slightly different topic. Uh, I want to mention a, a project that we have a couple of years ago in which we did a workshop uh, in Medellin. We invited German and Colombian researchers and, uh, to discuss uh, the topic of post-agreement, post-conflict Colombia and, uh, and what will happen to ecosystems. 
uh, we got this publication out of that uh, workshop, and we created something called PEACE. PEACE means the Plataforma, Plataforma de Estudios y Análisis sobre Colombia y sus Ecosistemas, uh, and in English will be Platform for Ecological Analysis and Colombian Ecosystems. We have a website, the uh, small website, there's not a lot of information there, but it, uh, you can go and visit the website. The main thing of PEACE is we, after this workshop, we came out with this idea and we want to propose uh, three important things. One is we, we think Colombia needs a national center for ecological synthesis. Colombia right now produces a lot of ecological information that is very important, but it's very difficult to put together. It's very difficult to analyze, and we need to do a lot more synthesis of this data to get useful information out of the data. We are also proposing to establish an ecological observatory for Colombia. Even though we have a lot of data, this data is, uh, has a lot of problems of uh, format, is not uh, compatible from measurements from one place to another, and we need to establish a new infrastructure that allows Colombian scientists to go and do new measurements and actually coordinate all these efforts in a much better way. And the third thing we propose is something called uh, platforms for interdisciplinary dialogue and action, and it's basically spaces like this in which we all, Colum the Colombian scientific community comes together and talk about these topics. We have a, a couple of projects already running. One was funded by NASA, has to do a lot with uh, observations from uh, space. And the other, we got a student in, in, in our institute uh, that is also working with remote Remotely sens uh, remote sensing observations, and also looking at changes of car, uh, you know, vegetation in, in the tropics and in Colombia. So with that, I wanted to thank you. This is my research group, and uh, I'll take questions afterwards. Thanks.